This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker, and I am extremely excited to share meeting today with Dr. Kate Rayom, and she is the person. We haven't really talked about her much. I talked to her about with friends and, and patients, but she has written a book called Vitamin K2 and the Calcium Paradox, How a Little-Known Vitamin Could Save Your Life. She's got some groundbreaking information. It's going to be so interesting to listen to. Kate, thanks so much for coming on board. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. It's going to be fun. So I'm going to read a little bit from our sponsor, and then we're going to go ahead and go. This is, we're really pleased to have, we're, we're really into biomedical measurement and data as opposed to in, uh, labels and games. And Core Brain Journal is sponsored by Great Plains Laboratory. They are international leaders in biomedical testing for factors in brain health, including metabolism, nutrition, food allergies, exposure to environmental toxins of all things, and much, much more. As both scientific and educational global thought leaders, they provide the most comprehensive set of hard data measurement tools for real biomedical answers beyond guesswork. And they also provide training webinars for both the public and medical professionals on how to use that data effectively in our offices and homes. Check out their website for references and testing details. And take note, friends, of this. This week, you can enter to win a complimentary organic acids test, a comprehensive metabolic test with 75 specific markers, all from one simple urine sample. Send it to Kansas. You get 75 answers. You can enter to win this test. Uh, they'll have a drawing for it at greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ call station. Why not get on it? Let's get the test, see what happens. So moving smartly along, let me introduce you to Dr. Rayom. She's a graduate and former faculty member of the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. Dr. Kate lectures internationally on many topics related to health and wellness and is considered to be a leading authority on vitamin K2. She is the author of that best-selling book that I was talking about a moment ago, Vitamin K2 and the Calcium Paradox, How a Little Known Vitamin Can Save Your Life. So we're going to hear the details. There are so many interesting things to talk about. We're not going to spend much more time on the intro. We want to get down to business. But before we actually do, let's talk a little bit on the narrative, Kate, and get squared away with who you are as a person and how in the Dickens you number one, discovered this idea. It's like, oh my gosh, this is interesting. And I, ha I think I have a guess about it, but I'll be interested to see what you, and then how you develop the concept because you're one of the few people that really is on top of this whole game. There are not a lot of people talking about it, which is why it's so exciting to have you on board. So how did all that start for you? Well, it was back in 2005, I came across some research on this nutrient, vitamin K2, and I thought, how strange is it that throughout my whole naturopathic training, my professional training, uh, my residency and whatnot, I've never come across this nutrient and this vitamin. And I did some more digging and I was surprised at the amount of research I found on it. Some of the earliest research was about cancer prevention and treatment in particular, used as a cancer treatment in Japan. But then the more digging I did, the more information and research I found. And I thought it was stunned that I, people weren't talking about it. And then around that time, the studies about calcium and then the problems with calcium, you know, people taking calcium supplements and having more heart attacks and strokes. And I realized that vitamin K2 played a big role there. So it was just a really important part of the, you know, or piece to the puzzle for many people's health conditions. Plus, it was also a potential solution to this conundrum when it, when it comes to calcium and so much more. And that, yeah, people just needed to know about this nutrient. Well, you know, it's so interesting, listeners, because we're going to talk about a variety of different conditions. Yes, we're core brain journal and we're interested in brain, so we're going to talk about some brain issues, but so many of the somatic things that K2 
Kate is going to talk about is directly related to brain function, either directly or indirectly. And K2 plays a major role through all these things, including things like diabetes. So we're going to work our way through a number of topics. So stay tuned. And what I'd like to do is ask you, uh, Kate, where would you like to start the conversation? Where do you think we need to go in and bend everybody's mind right off of the bat? There's so many aspects of this topic that are fascinating, and we could speak about it for hours, as you know, and I could talk about this all day. We could start with aspects of health with regards to brain, but it might be worthwhile to back up and, and talk about why vitamin K2 was so overlooked and why we're not, you know, why we haven't heard about it until now. And it's still so misunderstood. I still see Good it. Good idea. So yeah, it sounds great. So the K vitamins, it's actually a family. There is K1, K2. There are others, but really for our, you know, for importance and for nutritional considerations, it's really just K1 and K2. And there are big differences between them. They were both discovered at the same time in the late 1920s, 1930s. And actually the people who discovered them won a Nobel Prize. And yet they were essentially misunderstood ever since then. Most people have heard of vitamin K1. It plays a role in blood clotting. It's found in green leafy vegetables. And it's basically impossible to be deficient in vitamin K1 because the body recycles it. And they saw K2 at the same time. They noticed this other nutrient, and I thought, meh, K1, K2, same thing. We can more or less ignore these because you can't be deficient. But when it comes to vitamin K2, that's absolutely not true. You don't get it from green leafy vegetables. You don't, the body doesn't recycle it. And so deficiency is not just possible, but very common. There's been a number of studies now showing that vitamin K2 deficiency is widespread, like we've heard with vitamin D, but for very different reasons. And for that reason, it, it remained overlooked for about 70 years after its discovery. And like I said, it's still, there's still a lot of confusion around it. That's amazing. So did you open the door with Weston Price? Is that how it happened? I was thinking it might be. So tell us about yeah. it because a lot of our audience don't know Weston Price. They don't understand that. But I saw the pictures you had in your book. This was a really funny story. So I had read Weston Price's amazing work, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, his seminal work. And about six months later was when I first started finding these articles about vitamin K2. And the more I read about vitamin K2, the more I thought, you know, I'm sure that Weston Price spoke about that in his book. So I went back to his book and I looked through the index and I looked through every chapter and I almost reread the whole darn thing. And I was like, it's not in here. I don't get it. And it actually drove me crazy until, fortunately, it put me out of my misery. A couple months after that, Chris Masterjohn wrote a brilliant article in the Wise Traditions Journal of the Western Price Foundation linking vitamin K2 to Price's Factor X. So this is this nutrient that Price discovered when he did his travels and found that people all over the world in what he called the primitives, living their traditional lifestyles, had much higher intake of nutrients in general, and especially fat-soluble nutrients, higher intakes of A, D, and this third fat-soluble vitamin that he didn't know what it was called, so he just called it X. And for a long time, there was a big debate, what is this factor X? And it turns out it's vitamin K2. And so once that connection was made for me, I just couldn't stop thinking about this nutrient. Isn't that interesting? Because when you read the book and when you actually sit down, and I recommend everybody read Dr. Rayom's book because it's, I think it's mandatory. If you're on this program and you're listening to us talk, we may not have gotten you excited at all, but if you read her book, you will be terribly excited because it's referential, in my opinion, to every doggone living human being because there's so many people dealing with chronic illness, chronic diseases, that K2 and understanding K2 and its relationship to K1, some of the things we're going to talk about, and the breakdown of the two forms of K2, they're so referential to longevity. I mean, so many people are studying anti-aging and thinking about all these things, and all of us want to be wrinkle-free. K2 has something to do, friends, with wrinkles, okay? So you, it goes from like death and heart disease to wrinkles. I mean, it covers a very wide range of things. And you look at her book and you see teeth malformation in kids in these primitive societies. You see what's going on. So it gets pretty doggone exciting. So then, then you got to be interested. in how did you find a K2 as an innocent person? You know something about it. Now you're getting excited. Now what do you do? How did you ever 
find anything that had K2. What'd you do with that? Well, it took a lot of research time, a lot of digging to find more and more information. And all this while, you know, presuming that somebody was going to start speaking about it somewhere and nobody was. And so I thought, okay, well, I guess I'm going to have to be the one to do that. Mm -hmm. And when I realized the implications of the calcium supplement, anybody taking vitamin D, and I I would guess that most of your listeners are taking vitamin D, Mm -hmm. that it's important there, plus anybody who has concerns around heart health, bone health, fertility, brain health, I mean, you name it. That's when I realized there was both information for medical professionals as well as lay people who are interested in their health. And yeah, it just took a lot of digging, a lot of research, which led me into research about vitamins D and A and deeper understanding there and the connection between them. And eventually, yeah, I put it together to get the information out there. Well, tell us about, I'm guessing, and I'm leading you into a little because I'm guessing. I know a little bit about it. I don't know as much as you by any means. And that's why I'm so appreciative of you coming on so I can learn something from you. But I think that NATO business is probably how you got into it because- I'm guessing. Was that true? Yes and no. I mean, I did decide to go on a hunt for natto. So for people who don't know, natto is one of the highest known foods in vitamin K2. And it's a common breakfast food in some areas of Japan. It's a fermented soybean food that is somewhat, I guess you could say, notorious, legendary. It's, there's all sorts of interesting, you can find all sorts of interesting information about it. Some people absolutely love it and crave it, and others are challenged to eat it. I still <laughs> I'm struggling a little bit after it. And I did go on this hunt to find this, and that was part of the adventure. And that was absolutely part of the you know, like the experience for me. And also trying to find, getting to the bottom of where people can get or should or used to get this nutrient into their diet that we're just not getting anymore. So uh, listeners, that's spelled N-A-T-T-O. And uh, one of the ways I got into it was I was already interested in your book and I heard about it. And I had a, a lawyer come in who was in the wheelchair. He'd been shot in a fight when he was a kid. So he's in the wheelchair. And he's a very bright guy. He's got all this stuff going on. So he's like, he's mixing up his own natto. He had read the book and and they started mixing up his own natto. I can't, in the way that traditional Japanese did. He was encouraging me that I should be doing this in the morning. That it would be much more fun to have have the raw form. So we started going further down. So did you actually go to Japan or how did you figure out what the natto situation was? I have been to Japan, but this was long before I knew about uh, natto. It was a local Japanese restaurant that I found that happened to have it on the menu. Oh, I'm And I tried it there for the first time. And since since then, I've been able to find it frozen at my local Asian grocery stores. And I've had people send me natto in the mail. And people are also often sending me the recipes. Please don't send me any more natto recipes because I have (laughs) lots of (laughs) <laughs> you got a, another book, a, a natto recipe book. I can see it. I might. Yes, yeah. that's right. And I've also gotten a little bit of hate mail from the natto lovers who said I didn't give it a good enough, or maybe have talked people out of trying it in my book. But I absolutely do encourage anybody to try it. And I actually hear great things from people who tried it. And whether they like it or not, they eat it. It just has a unique taste and texture in particular. But I do encourage people to try it because I hear good things from people who use it. Listeners, unique is a political word, okay? <laughs> I'm trying not to raise the wrath of the natto lovers here. So let's talk, let's talk about the brain application. Let's start with Alzheimer's. I was really surprised in reading your book that Alzheimer's came under some of that rubric. And I, I, there are a couple of specifics. Heart disease and Alzheimer's are like must to talk about, as is diabetes. I think diabetes is those three are so commonplace. And then you and I were talking offline. There's a whole nother condition, which is extremely commonplace as a marker for K2, and that's psoriasis. How many people, oh my gosh. Anyway, let's start with the biggies. And before that, let me back up a second because I'm getting excited about hearing those answers. Let's break down a little bit, if we could, the two subsets of K2 and understand that a little bit before we go into the next level, if you don't mind. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so in nature, vitamin K2 exists in a number of forms. If you're looking at, for example, animal foods, grass-fed animal foods, you get what's called a short-chain version of vitamin K2. MK4 is, is the most common one. 
And then when you look at fermented foods, which is an, another source of vitamin K2, some but not all fermented foods, depending on the bacteria, will contain vitamin K2. And they will contain, depending on the food, by MK7, 8, 9, 10, 11. MK7 is predominantly what you'll find in natto. 8, 9, and 10 you'll find in a number of different cheeses. It sounds confusing and you don't really have to keep track of it. You don't have to worry about whether you're getting what form or this. You just need to be getting some vitamin K2. When it comes to supplements and shopping for supplements, you will find two types on the market, the MK4 and the MK7, which you can think of as a short chain and long chain form. By chance, it's also the MK4 is a synthetic form and the MK7 is bacterial derived, so considered to be a natural form. I'm not... And, Regardless of your feelings on natural versus synthetic, they both work. There's research behind both types, but they need to be used in different doses. I tend to gravitate towards the MK7 form for a number of reasons. It's effective in relatively small doses and a single daily dose that the half-life is long enough that it will carry you through to the next day. Whereas the MK4 form, you typically need to take it, you know, it's best taken three times a day because it has a shorter half-life. So when you're shopping for supplements, I tend to go with that MK7 form, but for people, you know, there, for, for other reasons, people may choose the MK4 form. That's fine too. So stay tuned, listeners, because before we get through this, we're going to talk about dosages and the whole thing. So mm -hmm. we're going to close with that because first of all, we want to think about applications and then we'll talk about treatment modalities. So, so we have a couple of different tools there, the four and the seven. And those are both K2. And then K1 is, not, uh, you know, what was going on before we started is Dr. Rayom mentioned that K1 is not so relevant. So we're not really thinking about K1 because it has more to do with the clotting situation as she discussed on, on the front end. But what we're looking at is this, the way K handles a variety of things from inflammation to calcium to. So could you talk a little more about that? Because that's we're starting to define the target a little bit more. So the big role that vitamin K2 plays is in calcium metabolism and regulation. So helping to keep calcium in the right place in the body. Specifically, it will help to guide calcium into the bones and the teeth. And it will make sure that calcium doesn't end up landing in soft tissues like arteries, heel spurs, kidney stones, you name it, anywhere calcium is not supposed to go. The body has a problem with calcium. It's, it's this double-edged sword. We always have calcium in relatively high amounts in the body. And for that reason, we've always needed to protect ourselves from inappropriate calcification because that tends to happen. So the body has an amazing and very efficient system to do this, but it depends largely on vitamin K2. So if the K2 is missing, then you will end up with osteoporosis. Or it's a big factor there, calcium leaching out of the bones, or calcium building up in arteries in a number of ways. And that's a massive factor in heart disease, for example. You know, there's been so much focus, when, and we can go into detail about heart disease, but there's been so much focus on cholesterol. And yet, cholesterol levels are not a good predictor of your risk of heart attack. Whereas, if you do a coronary artery calcification score testing or a scan on the heart, the amount of calcium in your coronary arteries is an excellent predictor of your risk of heart attack. So, the calcium here is much more correlated with those outcomes and those incidents. So K2, extremely important to keep calcium in its place. That's one big rule that we know of. So then just as a by the by, folks, Kate's book has 241 peer-reviewed references in it. So she's not messing around with this. This isn't hearsay. This isn't something she learned on the farm in Canada. This is serious business. So those of you who are saying, hey, it's a vitamin I don't know about vitamins. I don't know if I really need vitamins. What is this gobbledygook? I think what you have is serious 241 peer-reviewed references on a, a book that goes into much more detail on these things that we're talking about casually here in this brief conversation. Really, this brief conversation, as far as I'm concerned, is just to get you interested in reading the book because it doesn't matter what your station in life. You can be a medical professional. You can be a cardiologist. You can be an Alzheimer specialist. You can be a person who's interested in fertility. You can be an internal medicine doc who's interested in diabetes. If you don't read this book, you're missing out. It's as simple as that. It's not like maybe, what if, you just go ahead and read it and look at the references and you're really uh, going down the road very well. So let's just talk about heart disease since we're into it a little bit. So the calcium placking on the vessels really can affect 
And you can actually with K2 and using K2 effectively. And I want to thank you again for putting specific dosages in there. You know, you say, look, here's how you can reduce your coronary calcification. Who else can say that? I mean, I think that's groundbreaking. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. And it sounds incredible. But actually, as I was saying, the body has a system to deal with this because it's always had to deal with this problem. But it relies in large part on this nutrient. And I do give doses in the book, although I have to say that since publishing the book, there have been a couple studies that have come out that actually show better, uh, greater benefits in larger doses. So one of the most recent studies to look at reducing calcifications and, and markers of calcification is using about 400 micrograms of MK7 per day, or, or it boils down to that. They were actually doing a three times a week dosing that I, for reasons I won't get into, but about 400 micrograms per day. So that is more than I recommended in the book based on earlier research. And that one seems to be quite effective and very safe, by the way. It has been, vitamin K2 has been shown to be very safe, even at very high levels. And a question I get commonly is, well, if K2 is, is reducing calcification, is that making plaque less stable? And would, could that cause problem? You know, there's a vision of, say, plaque breaking off in chunks and uh, mm -hmm. going elsewhere. And that doesn't, it's absolutely not the case. We don't see adverse effects like that. So it, it is very safe. Well, then you were talking about the two other fat-soluble vitamins. Does one need to augment K2 with A and D? Or is there an augmentation strategy as well that's necessary to make it happen? What's, what's your thought on that? Now, the K2 has primarily been studied on its own. And there's been little, some studies have looked at it with vitamin D. But they do all, there's a trio here, and they do all work together. So vitamin D it will help us absorb calcium. Vitamin A will help us remove calcium from the body, which is important sometimes. And vitamin K2 in the middle will help it put it into or take it out of where it's not supposed to be. And so I think there is value in taking these three together. We're trying to, then the next question, of course, becomes what's the optimal ratio, which hasn't been established, but the rule of thumb I go to is roughly equal amounts of vitamin A and D. And then for every 1000 units of A or D, about 100 micrograms of the vitamin K2. And again, that's all my doses are in the NK7 form. Oh, that's interesting. Now, and what is the form of vitamin A that you recommend? D is D3, of course, but... Yeah, D is D3, of course. I typically look at the retinal palmitates. Mm -hmm. I've got no concerned with those, they're, mm -hmm. they're typically what's used in, in the research trials. Well, that's great. So that's very interesting. So then let's dig more into the nuances. So what people can do is if they've had myocardial infarction or if they've had a study and see calcification, so there's mm -hmm. some help for them. You know, you don't have to go in necessarily and have a stint put in. You might be at that emergency level where you have to have a stint put in. We're not negating that. But if you're at an early stage of something's not right, if you jump on this and go up to that 400 micrograms, you can actually start to see some changes. And interestingly, since I've read your book, we've used it. I've had people say, I don't know what it is, but my teeth are better. I never oh, yeah. noticed that my teeth are stronger. When I close my teeth, they feel mm -hmm. like they're firmer. So you can actually mm -hmm. feel it in your teeth, which was interesting to me. Yes, a lot of people comment less tooth sensitivity, which I'm convinced is now primarily a K2 deficiency issue. The plaque is not building up on the teeth as much. Yeah, there's the oral health is one of the few areas in the body where you actually can visually see or, or experience what's happening with the K2. A lot of it is, you know, deep inside, as well as varicose veins. It, please, if you have not taken K2 and you've got varicose veins, take a picture of them because I can't tell you how many people email me saying, I wish I'd taken a picture of my varicose veins before. <laughs> They're gone now, but I can't do it. <laughs> so. Isn't that amazing? You know, the, the varicose veins themselves. So... So while we're on the subject, another burning subject for me, because I have a medical colleague that I'm working with who has a child that has a diabetic condition. So you were quite clear in the book about the stage two diabetes, but we're talking, and this particular person has a child with stage one, and there's no evidence on it, yet by what you're saying, it sounds like I'm asking you out of the box a little bit because it doesn't sound like there's any uh, data on it, but do you have any anecdotal experience on that with people who've tried it for type 1? I do know 
an individual with, with type 1 diabetes who takes this on a regular basis, I can't say, I mean, he does lots of other things, so, I, so I can't say whether or not that in particular made a difference. But mm-hmm. given the fact that it does seem to help with insulin sensitivity, that's also important even for type 1 diabetics because they want to be able to use their injected insulin more efficiently. Mm-hmm. And for children, there are a number of studies that show that it helps with skeletal health, proper growth and development, and we know that adolescents among the most K2 deficient because basically when the hormones kick in and the skeleton starts to grow quickly, that's a time when the body needs more K2. And so the point is that for kids of any age, you know, diabetic or not, K2 is still a good idea and it may very well help with that diabetes. That's very interesting. Yeah, we'll have to see. The jury's out on that, but it definitely helps with type 2. Yes, type it helps on another Yeah. As well, we also know that diabetics tend to have higher rates of osteoporosis, and there's likely a connection there. And so that, well, you know, you're getting two outs with one pitch, so to speak. And and they also have higher rates of heart disease and dementia. And all of these things are linked. And so K2 is part of the solution there. So in just a minute, we come back, we'll talk a little bit about Alzheimer's because this is Core Brain Journal, and we'll hit the brain a little bit more. And there's some other very interesting ones that we want to make sure we hit on. So I'll ask you about the relationship between K2 and Alzheimer's in just a moment when we come back. Today, the world of mind science, psychiatry, and mental health is rapidly changing with innovative, comprehensive testing that takes both patients and practitioners into a new world of measured details with useful, understandable, and remarkably actionable plans. The key phrase here is cost-effective. Testing also introduces a key parallel word, predictability. Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medications and our brief hospitalizations, arises directly from the complexity of measurable brain-body imbalances and impediments that explicitly interfere with medical outcomes and create costly difficulties with inadequately informed supplement and medication trials over time. Great Plains provides a leadership team of biomedical experts with advanced laboratory insights approved nationally both by the FDA and CLIA laboratory certifications and is available internationally for both public and medical professionals. Great Plains Laboratory is the primary laboratory we've used at CoreSight for years with excellent customer service for both patients and medical colleagues. They are on the spot. They get it every time. In addition, they provide exemplary training modules, which are webinars and conferences, in an effort to broaden practice perspectives wherever you live. Do follow up on one of these complimentary test offers today at http greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash cbj. Yeah, that's Core Brain Journal CBJ. Well, Dr. Rayom, this is so interesting. Thanks so much for joining us. I know people are excited about this conversation. So let's go on with Alzheimer's. We're running through there. Again, the book is much more comprehensive, but I think it's very worthwhile and interesting to touch upon this because is there a more commonplace deterioration going on? I mean, we didn't talk about ADD, which is even more commonplace, but I won't bother you with that right now because I didn't see it in the book to tell you the truth. There may be there and I missed it, but let's talk about Alzheimer's because it's definitely a brain Mm -hmm. condition. And what's your understanding of that? How could we be helped with that understanding? It's interesting because we don't store vitamin K2 in very high levels well, we don't store it at all, but when K2 is in our diet in adequate amounts, it will tend to accumulate in a few places in the body. And one of those areas is the brain. And that suggests that it's you know important there, it's doing something there. And I was pleasantly surprised to find a couple of preliminary studies on potential implications for K2 and Alzheimer's based on a few different mechanisms. And of course, we know that Alzheimer's, you know, sometimes it's called type 3 diabetes. We know that it is frequently associated with atherosclerosis. There's a connection between all these concerns. And so I was happy. And I think there's also a number of potential ways and areas that it is helpful. One thing that's really grabbed my attention, and there is, and we can go into some of the specifics on, on the Alzheimer's level, which, but I've included that in the book, an area that I didn't focus on so much is that we know that 
Alzheimer's aside, one of the important factors in mild cognitive impairment or just decline in cognitive function with age are these ultra micro mini strokes, in addition to potentially TIAs and strokes, so very small strokes that are damaging areas of the brain. And because we know that vitamin K2 absolutely will prevent the damage associated with ischemia, so when there has been a loss of blood flow to some area to the, of the brain, temporarily or not, then K2 will minimize the damage done to that area. So just based on that to protect your brain from any kind of stroke that might happen or, or these even the small ones we don't see or you know potential head injury, I think that has huge implications for maintaining healthy cognition in the long term. Great. I mean, that's such an interesting point. You know, one of the things we kind of uh, semi-specialize in here, we're very interested in veterans and brain injury, mm -hmm. chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and we have a whole page that's just for vets because we see, we just don't think they're being taken care of properly. Uh, generally speaking, of course, some of them are, but we've got 33 or so experts talking about different aspects of this. Yours is going to add a dimension to it because what happens, so many of those individuals have had a post-concussive activity, whether in fact they had a flaming TBI or whether they mm -hmm. have a chronic traumatic encephalopathy from having been blown off the road. But the issue is that is a very interesting additional application that parallels the Alzheimer. And thank you mm -hmm. so much for sharing that because that's totally interesting. Now, what's the dosage on that kind of, do you have any thoughts about specific dosage on those guys? They haven't done as much research, and this is an area that I think is lagging in the K2 research. There's been a, you know, a lot of focus on bone health and heart health, but in terms of especially clinical trials for brain health and cognition, I think that's lagging, but I would tend to use the same kinds of dosages as for cardiovascular health, so that 400 microgram dose. Yeah, That's great. That makes total sense. So then now we're going to go to some other things. I thought the whole business of transplant, I mean, you know, you don't really think of transplant issues because they're sort of way out there in the arcane world of you're bringing somebody's liver in and putting another liver in, you know, sort of like that's beyond the pale. I mean, why talk about that when you have all these experts running around doing this? But I thought it was very interesting that you included that in the book because of, you go ahead and talk about it, because it's, there's some implications there with transplants. Well, I, I thought it was interesting that somebody had studied it. And so the fact that there was information there about it, that I, I thought it should be included. And it does have benefit anywhere that there's, you know, research on, on K2 benefit. I, I did want to include that. Mm -hmm. And so potential implications for better outcomes when it comes to transplants I think that that's promising. It's another area where I'd like to see more research with the K2. Well, and then let's talk about the big one for so many people. I mean, I think women are so significant in our society in terms of being resources, but so many people miss the whole hormone thing with women. It's amazing. You know, we see mm -hmm. people come in and I just do a routine evaluation on estrogen dominance with every woman that comes in. I mean, even down into teenage years to find out about their periods and what's going on with them. And it is absolutely amazing to me how many people are treated so lockstep with estrogens for an estrogen dominant problem. I mean, it's, it's a pervasive problem. And then parenthetical next to that is fertility. So could you talk a little bit about those items, if you will, please? Sure. So vitamin K2 has very interesting implications for estrogen in metabolism itself, in addition to, we know that, for example, after menopause, there are a number of changes when, when estrogen levels decline due to that change in estrogen levels that can potentially impact bone health. And specific studies have shown that vitamin K2 can counteract each of those changes to help maintain the bone health. But it specifically seems to have some impact on estrogen and also participates with vitamin D and they work together to help with estrogen metabolism. So that, I think that's important. And, and again, if the K2 is lacking, that it'll be that much harder to try to get these hormones back in balance. Now, when it comes to fertility, for women, fertility is more complex, but of course you want to have the hormones in balance. We can absolutely say, and there have been a number of studies come out since I've published the book to confirm with regards to male fertility. We know that vitamin K2 will increase testosterone levels and sperm counts, and this will uh, be beneficial absolutely for male fertility. 
So interesting. I mean, it just you think about it. I mean, here's another one of the pervasive markers. I mean, they seem so commonplace and so tous at the same time. You know, you really can't know. You don't know what to do about them. And you said maybe shoot them a little testosterone, whatever. But, you know, if you can actually do something, you know what the mechanism is by which the hormones are modified by K2? Do you have any any thoughts about that? Any specifics? It seems to also be involved with the osteocalcin protein, which is, which is uh, related to bone health, which is pretty interesting. And it may have some other mechanisms. We know that K2 is helpful, very helpful for prostate health. And again, a number of studies have come out recently to show prostate enlargement, BPH, as well as prostate cancer, that K2 is extremely helpful. Now, this is through other mechanisms, especially the BPH. It has to do with improved circulation, likely in and around the prostate. But I believe K2 is now being considered as a part of the treatment for prostate cancer. That is so interesting. I mean, that's another piece of information. Now, let's hit the more commonplace somewhat ubiquitous psoriasis. I mean, we were talking offline a little bit about that. Go ahead and share with our audience what you found out about that. This, this one blew me away and and because I didn't write about it in my book. And I have to say to date, there have been no studies. However, if you suffer from psoriasis, there is a website check out called freedomfrompsoriasis.com. And it's a woman there, Dakota, who's simply sharing her story of how she was covered head to toe in psoriasis and had suffered from it for four years and has been completely clear for, it must be almost going on three years now, after starting to take vitamin K2 for her psoriasis. And now there's a whole community of people who have benefited from this as well. And it's remarkable. Mechanisms, it turns out there is some something going on with calcium regulation in the skin, in the, in the dermis, and that may mm-hmm. be part of why. And of course, K2 also has some anti-inflammatory properties. And we know that most people with psoriasis are treated with vitamin D, and that can be helpful to a certain extent. But the number of, of positive feedback from individuals with psoriasis has been overwhelming. Of course, then you go into a whole nother long trip with immunity, you know, because then we see IgG problems that are off the map so frequently. Mm -hmm. And of course, we do it just by diet alone. But I mean, what we're talking about here is that if a person has a significant immune dysregulation with a food sensitivity, part of the healing process would be getting K2 and vitamin D on board ASAP. Because downstream from the good, please. Yeah, well, we know vitamin D is critical for the immune system. And basically, anywhere where vitamin D is required, you have to ask, what is the role of vitamin K2? Because they, they will work together. In addition to that you know, relationship where I mentioned earlier that vitamin D helps absorb calcium and then vitamin K2 will, will move it around into and out of the right places, there are a number of other overlaps. And essentially what happens is, and this is for anybody, any listeners who are taking vitamin D, when you take vitamin D, you increase the production of vitamin K2 dependent proteins. In other words, by taking vitamin D, you're increasing the demand in the body for vitamin K2. And so in, in a sense, you can look at it as you're almost creating a vitamin K2 deficiency unless the K2 is there. So in other words, you stand to benefit a lot more from vitamin D by taking it with K2, as well as so you get more from your vitamin D and, and more safely because it protects against the potential toxicity of vitamin D. One thing leads to another, Kate. Now we're into thyroid function. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, if you're talking about vitamin D and we're talking about immunity, mm-hmm. and we're talking about hypothyroidism and we're talking about hormones. So then I don't know, do have, have you have any knowledge about anything being written about that? I haven't seen anything come across on, you know, more information on that. Again, vitamin K2 is 10 or arguably 20 years behind vitamin D in terms mm-hmm. of its research. Yes. It's still early days. Well, so when you think about diabetes, we're talking about immune system dysregulation. Then you're talking about psoriasis. You're talking about immune system dysregulation. And in terms of old thinking, you know, that would be the immediate first thought. And now you're talking about other ramifications thereof and the relationship with uh, K2. It's pretty doggone interesting. I mean, it's just really, really great. So let me ask you this question, and we're getting short on time, and it's just so much fun talking to you. So postmenopausal women could do it. So people who are having hot flashes and all these postmenopausal issues, it could be helpful. 
And so the other thing I want to ask you about, which I didn't quite get to in your book, and it's there, I know, but I just didn't get a chance to read it, but I think uh, our listeners are going to be interested in, and that is, how do you do testing? Could you summarize a little bit about how a person could go? Is it available at LabCorp? What does one do to really find out what the status is? Unfortunately, at this point, it's not available. It's just being used in academic and research settings. When I wrote my book, I was hoping it would be available by now. I know there is a group that's working on making that kind of test available affordably and efficiently through clinicians and, and through you know your family doctor, that kind of thing, or even through specialized testing. It's there's some complexities to it. And long story short, that kind of testing isn't available yet to find out, determine your vitamin K status. You can't measure it directly. You have to measure the, the number of or level of vitamin K2 proteins that are activated in the body. That's what it'll tell you. So in the meantime, we just have indirect measures like bone density, like coronary artery calcification, these mm-hmm. kinds of things. So then a parallel question then on a reassuring note we know that A and D can be toxic, but your point was that K2 cannot be toxic. So it's not a fat-soluble vitamin? Well, it, it's interesting. It is a fat-soluble vitamin, but its mechanism is quite different. A and D affect our DNA directly, which is why taken on their own, they are potentially toxic. Whereas K2, it doesn't work that way. For the most part, it just activates the vitamin K2 proteins that are in the circulation. So if those are all activated, it doesn't have anywhere else to go or anything you know, bad to do, so to speak. So it's actually non-toxic. And uh, there have been a number of studies you know, looking at it in very, very high doses, showing that it's quite safe. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, mm-hmm. this has been a very interesting conversation. I mean, we've covered a lot of bases in a very, very short time. And I know our listeners are grateful as I am. I mean, we've added some really interesting things just to summarize. If you think about Alzheimer's and traumatic brain injury, then you talk about hormones. Then we're talking about all the various immune system dysregulations from diabetes, psoriasis. We're in a completely different land. And by the way, it's not going to be harmful. That closing note is an important point. So if you augment with A or D, you're going to want to watch those levels because a person could be at a bad level, although we, we haven't seen it because the levels we use are, are very careful about it. But we do monitor because we're, we want to make sure we don't create a problem for somebody. But the idea of the safety and then the broad applications, very, very interesting and convincing. Again, listeners, I have to tell you, you just have to go out and get this book because, I mean, who is not going to be interested in this topic for themselves, and even as an anti-aging, and tell finally you'll get a kick out of that. Now this is we're getting away from hard science here, but I know I'm going to have some people out there that are worried about wrinkles, and I just happened to think about this as I was closing up. What's the wrinkle thing? Well, one of the factors, not the only one, but absolutely a factor in development of wrinkles, is that the elastin tissue in the skin that's supposed to keep the skin elastic and mm-hmm. will, can become calcified at a microscopic level. And when that happens, it's not so elastic anymore. It's a contributing factor to fine lines and sagging skin. And because vitamin K2 removes calcification from areas that it shouldn't be, it will also do this. It does this, by the way, on the elastin in the arteries, helping to restore arterial flexibility, but it will do this in the skin too. So there is some anti-wrinkle activity. <laughs> Not so germane as the really deep things we were talking about, but I thought it'd be an interesting light note to tend with just as it occurred to me. So, Kate, thank you so much for coming on board. You know, it's been great. So this is Dr. Kate Rayom, and she's from Canada. You might have caught, caught the Canadian accent a little bit. Kate, we'd love to have you back sometime if you have some other wrinkle of, hey, this would be interesting. Mm-hmm. So tell us as we wind up how people can uh, get in touch with you, follow you, listen to your material. Please tell us that. Sure. People can reach me through my website, which is www.drkatendfornaturopathicdoctor.com. And my book's available on all of the online uh, booksellers. Yeah, we'll have all those links in the show notes, folks. You can just click on it. And we'll get, get you over to see uh, Dr. Rayom. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on board. Do come back sometime. We'd love to have you. I would love to. This has been so much fun. And thank you for spreading the word about vitamin K2. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, 
details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.